Thank you. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about an open source project called Cooper. Um, <clears throat> it's something that we have been building for about three years. We recently open sourced it. And uh, you will see what it can do. I mean, it's essentially an operations tool that we built because we had a problem to solve. Um, so a little bit of history on how Cooper came into existence. So we have a flagship product called CDAP. It's a data application platform. It's completely built on top of Hadoop. So we constantly needed a way for our engineers to be able to provision these clusters, 10 node cluster, 15 node cluster, with security, without security, on fly. Like a developer sitting at his desk would say, give me a cluster. 15 minutes, he has a cluster. He starts pushing his code into the cluster, and starts operating on top of it. So it was easy. I mean, we initially started with uh, stitching together a bunch of shell scripts. Um, so, and then we started out going, giving demos to our customers. And customer was more interested in this specific thing that provisioned the <laughs> CDAP. Um, so for one of the customer, he said, is this a product? And we said, yes, it is a product. <laughs> it's a right? So, then we ended up building that thing and building, turning it, this thing into a product and open sourcing it. Um, and that's how Cooper came into existence. Otherwise, it's a bunch of shell, Chef's recipes, Shell scripts. We used all our existing investment in Chef and moved it over to here. But we also made it open so that there can be other things uh, that you can integrate. So I'm going to be talking about this. You guys should check it out. It's, uh, it's on cooper.io. Uh, it's open source. There's the latest version, 9.9 which has a lot of cool features. You guys should check it out. So just to give you a little bit of background of myself, um, I'm Nitin, so I, am, I was a part developer and operations because when I used to run a front page of Yahoo for three months, I ran the operations. I used to be on um, production support. 365 days, 24 by seven. So I did that for almost um, a long time, it's two, three years. It's like, because we didn't have operations team. So I, I know how much pain someone goes through, um, how much you have to sacrifice to get something out. So that is half side of my brain. And half side, being a developer, I always look for ways to simplify the process of getting something in, being able to operationalize it. That's the most critical part of it. And developers, if you are only on one side of it, you can't understand the pain. Being in, I have, Because I have done both, I feel the pain from both the sides. And Cooper was essentially Built looking at what we were doing as a developer and what we needed as operations. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. Prior to this, I was at um, FedEx, Altera, um, Yahoo. That's when I started working on Hadoop. Um, and now I just chase ele elephants um, down the lane. I work completely on Hadoop now. So I'm going to be talking about uh, Cooper. The main problems that Cooper needs to be addressing is we were looking for a self-service automation, self-service reconfiguration of any type of cluster, any type of multi-tiered application plan, right? Uh, we started off with building uh, Cooper for just Hadoop cluster. But then we realized, okay, it's not just the Hadoop cluster. We want to have a MongoDB cluster. I want to have a Cassandra cluster. I want to have a lab stack. I want to have a mean stack. I want to have I don't know, some other stack, right? Um, but the problem there that existed was you would have to give a lot of information to the system to make it do what you want exactly. And we didn't want it that. We wanted all the smarts to be pushed down into the system so that the system can make a decision of how it lays out the cluster. So that's, a, that's the most interesting part of it. And make it everything self-service. That means the person who is requesting for the stack to be um, provisioned, he provides minimal input. The administrator can decide what is default, what is not default, and what he needs to be expecting from the user <coughs> So we needed we needed some way we could enforce policies, right? So when you create clusters on secured clusters, we wanted an ability to be able to say that disk four is always encrypted. The disk two is not encrypted. You wanted the files to exist in a certain place. You wanted those policies to be enforced uh, when any kind of stack is being created. We wanted capex management. Because when you look at it, we, we mostly use cloud <clears throat> for our general purposes, right? So, but we want we also have a limitation. Once we ended up uh, spinning, because initially for getting three node clusters was used to take a day, because there was one guy who was trying to spin these clusters up in the cloud. Uh, <clears throat> it ended up being that at some point we provisioned 300 node 
uh, ORA, all the team, every day provisioning. People were just provisioning and tearing it down. We didn't realize we had hit a major limit. And we were like spending $20,000 a day. Right? So that's when we realized we needed an ability to manage the overall capex. So we added those capabilities into, the, into, uh, into uh, Cooper. So we needed hybrid cloud support because we have our open stack instances. We use um, uh, Google Compute. We use we use uh, Rackspace. We use Join. We used all of these different things. But we wanted a seamless way to provision the stack in whichever cloud, whether it's private or public. It didn't matter, and it didn't matter whether it was um, uh, what do you say a uh, bare metal. So you would be want you should be able to install and create the same stack even on the bare metal. So we wanted one system that could move across all of these. It had to be scalable. We provision thousands of nodes of clusters on this. So we should be able to support any stack. So these were some of the problems that we saw that none of the tools that were existing out there were solving it and simplifying that to such a degree that it would make it extremely easy for someone who is not an operations guy who has built the system, like even admins could come and provision a cluster for us with Google. And it is that simple. So like once you can do that, then it just opens up a door for a lot of innovation in many different aspects. So I'm going to be talking uh, about specifically things around automation and reconfiguration, but uh, I want to start with just the demo so that you guys can see how it works, right? And then we can go into the details of it. So first of all, Cooper is uh, multi-tenant. So I probably have multiple different windows opened up here just to show you guys uh, different browsers. So. <clears throat> So you can configure, as a super admin uh, with Cooper, you can configure tenants. So there are multiple tenants you can define. Um, so you have dev tenant, ops tenant, there's a super admin who's a tenant, oh, that's a back of, my, uh, back of me, oh, that's a different thing. So you can configure as many tenants as you want. Now, for each tenant, you can give capacity. So you can essentially say, you know, I want to have six number of workers, which is basically providing you quality of service. So if, if your tenant or your line of business or department is make, creating a huge number of requests essentially for provisioning, you can increase the number of workers essentially to provision that. And you can limit how many clusters you can have and how many nodes um, are in total can be provisioned for all of the clusters. So you could be having one cluster of 60 nodes or you could be having 10 clusters of six nodes each or a distribution between them, right? So this is a limit that a, a super admin can set on tenants. Now imagine this way. <clears throat> so within, let's say, in Cerner, you have um, a bunch of nodes. Let's say uh, 100 nodes available. You have put OpenStack in, the, in front of it. You put Cooper on top of it. Now you give that to five different departments. And you set limits on each one of them. And then you could essentially say, based on how much funding a department provides for the main cluster, you could allocate that, minimum, that, minimum, that much amount of resources or quota for them, right? So that's something a super administrator can do. The other thing a super administrator can do is he can push down policies down into every tenant. So for example, um, company-wide you say that there have to be certain directories that are either encrypted or there are certain directories that should not be existing, all your logs should be there. So you can push the, that information, template information, down into each one of the individual tenants. Uh, you can do it through UI or you can do it through REST APIs. So it essentially, super admins are responsible for doing that. Now, now I'm going to be going into one of, uh, sorry. Here I'm an administration administrator of Castel, right? And you can see here, these are a bunch of different templates that have been defined within um, in the catalog for that particular tenant called Castel. So this is a template. You can see you have distributed systems, you have LAMP stack, you have, I'm sorry. So you can have LAMP stack, you can have MongoDB, you can have anything that you want, right? Now let's drill down into one of the, let's take a simple thing. Lamp. So this is the LAMP stack. Now the LAMP stack here shows that the administrator for that particular tenant defines a template. He basically says this is the LAMP stack and you can also specify something called the lease duration. So that means anyone can create a cluster but the administrator can say 
within 24 hours, I'm going to take your cluster back. Or you can say, yeah, this is for infinite time. Or you can say, this is for a certain period of days or whatever. Now, within those period of days, if you want someone who wants to extend the lease, you should come in and say, I want to extend the lease on this specific cluster. and that. But that's something that an administrator controls. Now, in here, he basically specifies different kinds of services that could be part of this particular application stack. So he can just pick and choose and keep adding from the list of services that have been already defined, just keep adding to them, right? Now, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how these services are defined, but they're pretty easy to right? So you, you add as many services as you want. This is essentially saying it's a compatible tag. That means you can add 15 different services that are compatible as part of the lab stack, but when someone creates a cluster, he's going to be specifying the defaults. So you say, these are my default services that needs to be existing when the cluster is created. But after the cluster is created, I can, or the user can come and say, add these other compatible services that are not part of the default after the cluster has been created, like 10 days later. And system re-adjusts itself for that. And it makes sure like there are no conflicts. It will not move the nodes which has the data. It has all of the intelligence built into it. It's, it has something called a planner and a solver that I'll talk about. So you can specify the defaults. The other interesting thing you can do is you can specify constraints. This is where the breach of the brain of all of the Cooper exists. So instead of essentially saying that you know put this particular service on this machine, this service on this machine, you provide constraints. You say, my constraints are, my SQL cannot be on the same server as uh, HTTP server. That's a constraint you provide. Now then you can ask me, give me a 15 node a LAMP stack and the ratio of my SQL server to HTTP server is, let's say, something, point two. So that means it is going to be proportionately provision that big of a LAMP stack, but it will proportionately adjust the SQL servers and my uh, HTTP servers based on that. And also, when you extend the size of the cluster, or when you expand it, it's going to keep that in ratio and also take the, the constraints that have already been imposed when you materialize the cluster as the new set of additional constraints and then figures out how it needs to be laid out again. So it does all of these dynamically. So in this specific example, you can see my lab stack would be, be having the lab stack by itself. It can be one node or it can go up to two billion. It doesn't matter. No one does that. But that's an existing. Then here it also says that must coexist constraint. That says HTTPD, PHP, and PHP model should coexist together. You can also specify it doesn't coexist together. You can also specify what are the ratios of like max. Max of one. So that means when you take a cluster and you create 10 nodes of this, it is going to, pro it is going to ensure that HA proxy and MySQL server there is only one. If you don't put this constraints, it will scale proportionally. Does it make any assumptions on like what the, the node is or the, the host or whatever? Like, um, yes. So VMware you can specify or, you can okay. specify hardware types, okay. or you can specify the image type. So you can say you know I want small, medium, large on this. Otherwise, what it is going to do is it's going to use defaults, everything as a medium. So for every machine that gets created within the stack, it's going to use the default standard medium. What about I don't see a way to. Add SSL certificates. Is that? I get okay, it. That's in it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so then you can specify DNS and you can specify JSON. You can see ultimately this is the JSON that get created. This is just the one way of doing it through UI. You can just publish this whole thing through REST APIs, yeah. right? And you can maintain this. It's pretty easy. Um, you can maintain this wherever you want. So so now I talked about services, right? So before get to getting there, uh, there's one notion of what we call providers. Providers are essentially uh, where um, the IS providers, you know, the public cloud provider, or, uh, or you, have, you can have OpenStack. But you can define the providers. And there is a provider plugin that you can write in the backend. And all of the UI is powered by the configurations that you define in the backend. The UI is dynamic. If you define a new field in the backend, the ops guy defines a new field in the backend, it shows up in the UI. So anyone can go in and add those fields. He can default it. it. Makes it extremely easy for someone to interact with it. What's the what's the backend code? What language? The server, uh, the backend actually uh, is in Ruby. So the server is in Java, but the, the provisioner, where the operations 
have to happen. That's all it is. Um, so you can define all of these uh, fields in there. You can put your keys. You can do. I'll show you the, uh, the code for this. It's pretty simple. You can create new providers. Uh, actually, you can deploy new providers through the UI itself or through REST API. So it makes it extremely. It does versioning management of providers. It does all sorts of things with it. Um, so you can also define OpenStack. Um, we use OpenStack internally. So you can define your own OpenStack instances, um, and tenants, and all those network management. Pretty much, you can give as, ma as many configurations as you want. Then, when you define a hardware, let's say you have three OpenStacks, and you want to centralize it across all of the companies because someone might name it, like, you know, differently. You can standardize this across all of these. So you can come up with your own nomenclatures of what a hardware type means. And then you can map it down to different hardware types for different cloud providers as well as um, internal providers. Right? So you can do the same thing with images. Right? It's pretty easy. So this, this thing is not that difficult. Here is where you can specify SSH user, SSH key, those kind of things at a provider level. Right? Now, here's where the interesting thing starts happening. So these are defined services. So administrator basically says that when he has written shell scripts or chef to install a bunch of different things, right? Then he comes in and creates a service in here. Now, let me go back to the MySQL one, MySQL server, because that's an example that we are using. It's not complex, but you can see here that it's a MySQL server. It provides conflicts, I'll get into all of these, but it has lifecycle hooks. So you can essentially see for configuring, it is using my chef recipe, recipe MySQL server, right? For installing, it's basically including that as a parameter. For basically starting and stopping, it has the defined recipe that comes with the Cooper itself for starting the services. So you can also define either it be a chef solo, a chef solo a Docker or a shell. So you can add more types into the system. And it's dynamic. You don't need to restart even any part of the system. It's dynamic and it versions it, it transacts it, and the states are maintained, so it can roll back all of those things. So for example, if you push in a wrong chef solo, chef script, sorry, you can roll back that from the system. And there are APIs all to do that. Now if you look at a more complex one, um, let's say if I go to data node, you can see it has a little bit of complexity in the there. So this basically says that when this service is being configured, right, uh, it doesn't conflict with any of the services that exist. It, it doesn't provide any of the service, this particular service to anything else. But install requires a base service to be existing. That's a constraint. You can imagine these all constraints are being added to the service. This cannot exist with this, plus the service itself has the constraint. So now you can also say install uses Kerberos client. That means if Kerberos client is there, only then it is going to use. If not, it's going to go without it. You can also say runtime, it requires name to name node, HDFS name to node to exist. Runtime uses Kerberos client. If it is not there, it's okay. So these constraints can be specified. So you can imagine you have service with a bunch of constraints. Then the whole topology of the network has how these services have to be laid together. So in your mind, it might be going, okay, so now I know how the things, I can take all of these constraints and come up with a map of how these services have to be laid out. And it goes through a complete search in figuring out the best solution, and it's very deterministic. And every time, we find a pattern for it, but it, it basically <coughs> does every single time, it will come to the same solution. And the thing that it does after that, if you change any of the constraints, and you have already materialized the cluster, it's going to take original constraints plus the materialized constraints. That means this machine, this particular service is tied to this machine. It's going to take that as an additional constraint and then look to how it can scale it up. So by this, the simplicity comes in what, what I'm just going to show you guys, right? So I logged in as myself. This is the third actor in the system. This is me, Nitin. I'm going to create a cluster. So when someone administration the administrator publishes, let me log in here. Log in. So I log in as myself into the tenant cast admin. I will be able to see. Uh, 
question. Say, media. I have a bunch of different things that are described. I'm going to create just, just for, um, so something big. Let me create something big. So I'm going to create like a five node header cluster. I can now have an ability to choose a bunch of things. So let's say I don't want region server because administrator has said by default this needs to be existing. I'm going to say remove these. I don't need it. Or just for the interest of time, I'll make it fast. Okay. So you have, I, I don't want these services. I can remove them on. I can add them later once the cluster is created. I just go in and say create the cluster. Now, what happens is it took the template, it took your constraints, and it now it is figuring out how I have to lay out lay out this cluster. So now it has figured out how this cluster needs to be laid out. So if I go here, you can see automatically it has created two nodes with four services each, and one node with five services. Now, why is it doing so? Because DFS uh, data node and name node could not be existing on the same box, so it split them across. Actually, so that's all. I didn't play. I didn't tell which service should be going where. If you want, you can add that as a constraint and extend the system. But by out of the box, you don't need to do that. And every time we have seen, sometimes there is a requirement to basically say this is where it needs to go. But that's that's okay. And then you are able to basically look at like the life cycle of it. So if I go back to the administration side of it, I will be able to see the administrator is now able to see the specific cluster being created. And there are many other clusters that are part of it. You can see the number of operations that a cluster does. So you can also see if it fails, <coughs> it retries and it, it, it's transacting before it's starting a new phase. That means it can revert back to the original state without making any change to the configuration. So it attempts, it checkpoints, it attempts. If it fails, it comes back, it tries again, it does it for the configured number of times. So from a user perspective, he still gets this cluster reported, but from an administration perspective or from an operations perspective is going in to look for the problems with the cluster, is able to easily find out what was the, it's not the partial states that are remaining, what happened, which services went down, where, those kind of things don't exist. It is always the state, if it can roll back, it will roll back, and it, there is a HA to this, so the other system will take over uh, rolling back to that that are being happening. So you can see a huge number of operations that were being done. There's a lot of coordination that's going on, and all this is being done seamlessly, right? Um, so then, what you can also do is, you can go in, in this specific case, reconfigure this cluster. That means I want to, select, say, in this thing, he has added pretty much everything. Um, let's see, which one should I take? I take something that is. But you can essentially go and reconfigure a configure. Uh, you can go and reconfigure something. Now the interesting part of reconfiguration is uh, that I think. I so let's say if I go and change core site XML, or let's say if I change some configuration in uh, a configuration file that is, if that particular configuration changes, service that particular service has to be restarted. But there is an order in which the services, other services, have to be restarted. Because it has created the service DAG, and it remembers the service DAG, it is able to go figure out the order in which these things have to be started. It makes it extremely easy for someone. You can you can yourself control it if you want to, but by default, it figures out what is the order in which these things have to be started. So it simplifies the whole process of it. So if I modify something in here, and I basically say um, restart at the end, uh, yeah, so then it, oh, it's creating a new cluster. So if I basically modify some things in here, and it's going to start exactly the same set of services, I mean, sorry, the, the services that are tied to each other and in the order that is correctly represented by the DAG when it originally created by the service dependencies. So that makes it extremely simple for someone to essentially um, be able to figure out what needs to be happening when some configuration changes. The other thing that it also supports when you're provisioning is I can go uh, this is one of the customer requirements. I can pause. 
the provisioning. So after the phase is done, it pauses the provisioning and it waits for callbacks to be happening. And once the callbacks are initiated, then it forces, it pushes it like it continues further. So this is needed because one of the use cases that um, our customer had was they had to do manual step for going and doing something on a machine. So when it reaches a certain stage, they want an automatic pause. And when they go back in and then say, now resume again, then the provisioning should start. Right? Um, so there are a lot of callback hooks. So from a, uh, if you guys see, uh, there are a lot of, you can support callback hooks on a different life cycle of the whole uh, provisioning. So if you want to stage the modification of the environment, are you able to do that? Or is it when you modify, they, they get pushed to the Is that what the pause is doing? So uh, what do you mean? So like, let's say you're an admin and you want to do like in a test environment, you want to change something, but you don't want to push it to production. Oh, yeah, yeah. you can pick up the version. So all those in REST API, we haven't moved it yet to the UI. So the UI doesn't have a good unit of fact. The UI will be adding it soon. Okay. Uh, but you can essentially do it pretty much everything through web services. Um, so you can publish, you can look at the resource, you can, there are a lot of things you can add a public, you can essentially experiment it and then make it active rather than you essentially trying to do it on like on a real system and affecting others. Actually, that's what you're asking. Right? Yeah, if you can, if you, yeah, you can do on that. Because the change control process. Yeah, because then you can, you can apply sync and once you apply sync, it gets pushed down. If you can. So sync is an ability to push it down and per you did to the system. So, so there are a lot of APIs that allow you. The other thing that are there is like being able to export all of these and move it to a different cluster. So from one cluster to another, it makes it extremely easy to do that. So pretty much all of the things that I was talking about here can be managed through REST API. So you can automate it your own way, essentially. And for Cooper itself, we provide a command line tool that it's a Cooper shell on which developers are essentially saying, give me a cluster of this type. So the thing that we do with this, Cooper, is on a nightly basis, we do this. This is how the CDAP gets tested. 104 combinations are <coughs> tested on nightly on two different clouds parallelly. We provision them left and right, and then we run tests, massive tests, 1,600 tests gets run against each one of those cells. Complete and Cooper is used for managing all of that, right? And it is integrated with Bamboo. So Bamboo, I mean, you can see actually. If you, you guys should be able to see if you log in there. Um, Build.cast.co. <clears throat> Audi test from the. Uh, oh, this is for enterprise. Yeah, it is integrated, but the, for the enterprise, it's on our uh, internal stuff. But Audi test runner. So this is all going and provisioning the clusters then running the test, and then tearing down the clusters. And it'll keep doing 104 times. So it'll do, it does it in parallel, but like it can do all of that. And different combinations. So Cooper essentially goes in and does all of these tests. They're all bamboo triggered, um, and you can have any different software stacks. And Hadoop is like, essentially, slightly complex one, because you have many different components as part of that. I'll get back to the cluster that I started provisioning and then we can clear on hope, making sure that I resumed it. Are you guys tracking the feature requests you're working on on uh, Cooper anywhere, or is it just kind of? Uh, Issues.cast.co. It created the machine, it bootstrapped it, it configuring it, it's configuring, monitoring, and all that stuff. Um, so there are a lot of things that are part of Cooper. So we also expose Cooper as co.pr. So it's the same instance that is being exposed for Cooper in Cloud, where you can go and provision anything you want. It's a free service. We just did it for fun on a hackathon, actually. So you can just go and log in with your GitHub ID and provision any other cluster. And you can provision it on the cloud, whichever cloud. Um, so coming back to this, any any questions so far? 
have a question. Is there any concept of like pre-allocating vanilla VMs to make the initial clusters better faster? We call it pooling. Right. Um, pooling is an ability that is added, but uh, it's being used. We don't use it. Um, as a startup, we don't we don't have the luxury of holding it and the requests don't come in, but our customers do use pooling. So in that case, what you would do is you could define a predefined pool. Um, the capacity, you could say 20 VMs right there. So they are bare bone VMs and the system figures out what are the base plate that is needed on those VMs, depending on across different variety of uh, services that you have. Uh, once, the, once the VM is there, it is allocated to the pool. Now when you ask for a cluster to be provisioned, it will take things from the pool and make it part of the cluster. So you would save the provisioning time actually. So it, the, the average, oh, sorry, with the OpenStack and all that included, one node also takes like 10, 12 minutes, depending on um, how OpenStack is running. But you can essentially reduce it that down to like one minute or two minutes. Yeah, so people have done that. It's called pooling, so you can keep the pool up, you can define how big the pool is, yeah. but there is a cost you have to incur for it. OpenStack has kind of a trashier version of this. They have a project called NodePool, which yeah. does that, but it's not as slick. So, so you can here maintain it, and there are certain, like we compute a lot of statistics across all of these, so there's like, um, the API, the REST APIs, you guys can check REST APIs, but we maintain a lot of statistics. How much time it's taking there? How much is like you know? How many changes have been happening? How tenant? How active a tenant is? There are a lot of metrics that are being aggregated that helps operations to be able to do more of capacity planning, right? So you be able to go take that and be able to say you know, this is what you guys are doing. You need to spend some money here, right? Um, so you can have kind of a chargeback model essentially built on top. So it's great to sweat down. Okay, so now now that you guys have seen it, so these are essentially the building blocks of Cooper, right? So we have provider, provisional, constraints, uh, services, templates, and automated. So now everything revolves around these, so it's essentially sitting on top of it and allowing you to extend any, any part of it, actually. So you can write a plugin. The plugin is, I agree, it's in Java, you have to write, but you can extend the constraint. So I'll tell you one of the constraints that was written, very interesting constraint. So one of the provider was provisioning um, MongoDB clusters, um, MongoDB nodes. MongoDB has like, sometimes they will say 80 gig or something like that. It's like in a, in a Solaris, they had Solaris machines with uh, VMs. You guys can probably guess who the IAS is. Um, so what they wanted was, they didn't want two VMs of such big sizes to be existing on the same physical machine. So anytime when a customer comes and says, give me 80 gig, its system made sure, Cooper made sure that they are not existing on the same physical boxes. Now that went in as a constraint into the system. So they wrote a plugin that took that as a constraint. So that means you could essentially reduce, you can standardize all of these different constraints and layer it into the system so that any templates you're building, any anything that you're doing, you don't have to re reinvent the wheel every time when you build a template. You can embed that into the platform itself. Uh, and that way it enforces all of this. So constraints is the most important part of it. You can, you can build your own constraint engine on top of it. Um, so that's something we patented actually because that allows you to place services in a very efficient way. And also the important thing that it does is very deterministic. It has to reach the same state every time when you ask for when you say provision the same number of nodes. It cannot be doing different kinds. Once it places machine here and next time it here, it cannot do that. So, so that's essentially part of that. Uh, services you guys saw, you can define as many services as you want and template is a collection of services and constraints. Uh, automated <coughs> is the backend, which is a plugin that you can write in Ruby. Um, you can deploy and manage through Cooper itself, but the whole idea there is you can control life cycle. You have a chef automated comes out of the box. You have a Docker automator that comes out of the box. You have a shell automator that comes out of the box. But if you want to write a Python, uh, sorry, not Python, Puppet automator, you need to write that using the automator. Yes. So the whole idea there is it basically helps you stitch different um, providers 
for automation integrated into Chef, so then Chef, uh, sorry, Cooper, and Cooper manages everything on top. And provider, as you guys seen, it's the you're connecting through different um, IS providers. So we generally use internally FOG. I mean, you guys might be familiar with FOG. So we use FOG internally. We tried using the knife plugins to begin with, and it was such a pain. Um, so we decided not to use knife, but go FOG. Which our knife underneath uses FOG, so we just went with FOG and then managed FOG. So from that perspective, when you look at provider, it's an instance of an infrastructure, right? So we talked about this. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. OK. Light is there. So you guys know the provider is essentially, um, it can be a bare metal machine. Intuit uses it with the bare metal machines, actually. So they have 10 machines. And uh, they put a HTTP endpoint on top of it that is keeping track of allocations of the machines. OK, I gave this machine to you, this machine to you, this machine to you. That's all it does. And they have they have created their own stack instances. So all it does is allocate machines. Right? They are allocating physical machines. They are not allocating VMs. Right? But you can essentially do that. So they have their own provider for physical machines. Now the next one is automator. So these are plugins that are responsible for the life cycle of it, right? So you can manage the life cycle of installing, um, removing, starting, stopping, and reconfiguring. So all that is managed through this. Um, so we, out of the box, we have chef meal, but you can build your own stuff on top of that. The same thing with templates. These, we call them like template, but they're actually the blueprints of it. So you can port them. You guys saw how the template looks like, but it's just end-to-end -end definition of how a stack should look like. And you define the whole stack, not the parts of the stack, or the layers of the stack. You define the whole stack. Right? The same thing then with services. These are pieces of software that can be made available in the cluster. You can define as many services as you want. And you can define constraints on them. And the best part of the services and template is before it starts even provisioning, it will make sure that your whole cluster can be provisioned and is can come to a deterministic state every single time. So that's something Cooper will make sure of that. Only then it will go ahead with the provisioning. So you can define as many constraints as you want on the services. The template is going to resolve it. So in the new feature, uh, I think Canis Majors, uh, no, I don't remember the new release name, but in that release you can extend services from other services. You can extend templates from other templates. So I can have a template A, and you can do uh, inheritance from it. You'll be able to do in, uh, composition of it. So they'll have different meaning. One will override the other. In some cases, you can use the other thing. So this will allow people to not just attach services, but also be able to pose more complex templates along with that, and be able to distribute them across many different teams, essentially. And they being responsible for their, uh, their part. So the same thing. Uh, constraints, these are these are open-ended. You can pretty much, we out of the box provide limit-based, hardware-based, um, where the layout needs to be, but you're not just limited for that. You can essentially build your own thing, whatever those limits are, or whatever those constraints are. You want to check your website and make sure that you have, or you want to check your bank account and make sure that you can essentially place this service, you can do that. Right? So uh, it's not limited just to what we provide out. Last one is the provision. This is a slightly interesting piece. Of it. So with Cooper, you don't need to install any agent on the box. There is no agent required on the box. It will manage agentless. Right? Now, this brings up some problems um, in um, cases where we had some customers um, where SSH is not allowed. We use SSH to get into it. Right? So you have to set the SSH keys and then SSH in, and then have a <coughs> chef solo start and then you do the run, installation, pushing SAP. So we do all that like a normal operations guy would do, right? Um, so that it becomes the steps become repeatable. But in some cases, sometimes there might not be SSH port available, right? They, they firewall it. In that case, you would need an agent because the connection has to be established the other way, not. Uh, outgoing in, but like from inside out. So in that case, there is a plan to add an agent. 
So right now they basically built their own HTTP endpoint, but then they wrote an automator to basically call that. So, but we lot of out of the box we providing a provisioner. So this provisioner does a lot of things. It actually initiates all of the operations that you have to be doing on the cluster. It, it's responsible for running it on those machines. And Cooper is responsible for making sure who goes first, once it's done, if it's a problem, checkpointing, moving forward. It, it does all of the complex stuff behind the scene. So it's only Chef Solo? It's not like a Chef Client idea where you check into it? So you can, you can actually do um, Chef Server. Okay. You, you can integrate Chef Server, but we decided to, we had a problem with managing Chef sure. Server, so yeah. Solo was the same. But we initially had it in Chef Server. So Everything kind of runs in like that detached mode of Chef Solo, like just and then checks Everything back is in. in Chef Solo. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. In, in our case, right? But you can have Chef services because the problem is like when you remove the node, you have to go re-register there. Like you have to remove from it, otherwise the I call it the D bag, the data bag becomes like too big. Um, and if you constantly keep doing this, it becomes extremely huge and unmanageable. Um, so we basically did want to. Let's go back to the machine and see what's happening with the machine. Hopefully, it's done. So that's a machine that I just created. And I created a Hadoop cluster. I am going to do one thing. I'm going to add HBase master after the, so let's do this, right? So this is the name node, uh, 5100. The name node address. So this is HTTP, right? Now, if you look at six zero zero one zero is H base, right? Six zero zero three zero. No, six zero. No, there is nothing. So we'll try that. So I haven't installed H base on this, yeah. right? So I'm going to go back to this cluster and say add service. I have not installed high on this. So I'm, I am going to submit this. So now the engine kicks in. It's figuring out how should I lay it out again. Do I need to go get, get more machines? Or can I just place these services on the cluster itself? Right? So it's now going to put you can see HBase master was placed here and region server was placed here. The interesting part now is it's starting and stopping all of the services. It's installing now HBase region server. So like, you don't need an administrator to, to come and tell me how to do this. I can sit here and do this. Right? Imagine your developers who are essentially sitting there and saying, I want a machine. You can give them a tool that will basically say, do whatever you want with it. And I will manage the backend constraints of it. Right? So now it is going to install. Now the thing is, it has to restart. Now, how does it know how to restart in the right order so that all the services come back up? That's where the DAG comes in. The DAG is essentially telling how the services are tied together. What are the constraints on each node? And it's going to follow that DAG till it ensures all of the services in the path of the node that is being affected are restarted in the right order. What happens if it gets on or it fails? Very good. It will attempt, it's like I said, it checkpoints, right? So if it fails, let's say three times, it's, it will bring back all of the services, like no HP stuff ever on the cluster. So it and it re reverts. restarts and gets back to the original state. So it reverts? It reverts. What happens if it gets stuck trying to revert? So when you basically, let's say, uh, what's a good example of that? You got a file log. Let's say there is a file log or something it gets, right? So it times out the operation. Uh, every operation gets timed out. So for example, sometimes you, you're right. So if this is what happens. So like you start a node, you SSH, and suddenly SSH is not working. There is a network fragmentation. All the nodes are fine, one node is having a problem. Right? So in that case, what it leaves is, and in that state, what ends up happening is it basically quarantines particular cluster, and then administrator has to come and look at it. Where is that issue? Does it set off alerts? It does. It does. You can set off an email. Again, it's again pluggable and configurable, so you can integrate that with your messaging system. So, 
service is in the node of the DAG, right? Each service is the node, and the edges define the constraints. Each service is independent of each other unless they are connected by an edge. That means you have said this particular service depends on this service. Right? Only then those constraints are uh, come into play and based on the type of constraint that you have defined. So for example, if you say uh, it requires then it creates a strong bond between the services. Right? You, if you say it's okay if it is not there, then it's not going to be bothering about it. Right? Um, so let me see where it is now. Okay, so it's starting the region server up. So it installed, it configured the region server, now it's back up. Right? So if I go back, H base master is in the how much time did, time did I take? Not much. Someone had to do this manually? Manually. It takes a lot of time. Maybe okay, the machine. Another question? Uh -huh. I was saying all day. Uh, it takes a long time, right? Yeah. Um, so this simplifies your process, right? It gives the power. You, you, like the our DevOps team now feels so much in control. First of all, they don't have to stop, and they get to dictate stuff because they have all the time in the world to dictate now, right? Hey, this is the template you should be using. This is the version. This is how it needs to be laid out, and they're spending a lot of time doing that rather than figuring out. Oh, you need a cluster? Okay, let me do that for you. And you spin up ten times. You spin up this. You fail ten times. You debug a problem that you should not be debugging. All that thing goes away. And we are provisioning at a, like a, at, a, at like a massive scale. Now, we have added a lot of limitations into the systems, like you can threshold, you can do all of those things, but a lot of metering API, a lot of metering APIs that we have added. It comes up. So then, it's very easy to install too. Um, and you can read about how internally the whole thing works. Actually, the, docu the documentation is pretty extensive. Um, that's something, even though it is open source, we maintain documentation as if it's a product. And every single FAQs that come in, um, it's documented. Um, it has a lot of information. It, we also compare it against different technologies. Um, that's the most important thing for us. Uh, if people are afraid of licensing and what goes, and what licenses are part of it, all that information is also available. Um, so the interesting part of all of this is essentially how it works. And this describes exactly how it works. So you guys can go and read this, but how it lays out the cluster, how the constraints are applied, um, all that information is there. How the planner stages it, how it linearizes it. Once it knows how it's linearized, how it goes and executes them in parallel wherever it can. So all that you don't even need to do. But if you want to change it, then yes, you don't need to. Um, but it's pretty easy to change that. Well, I kind of have a dumb question. How does the developer know which servers to hit when you've got those kind of diverse configurations? Do they have to hit the Cooper API? Like if, if you're hosting a, a Duke server and you've got the like the, the HTTP on one end, how does the HTTP client know what server So you have to. You have, so you, you you have, have your, you've got your database to where it can be either on that cluster or somewhere else, and that's defined by the admin templates. How does so admin basically says these are the services that needs to be given, right? And then I come in. Let's say you build that template for Lambstack. Okay. I come in and I say, give me five node cluster on Google Compute or five node Lambstack on OpenStack here, right? So what then Cooper does is, I tell Cooper that. And you have provided the template to Google. Mm -hmm. Now, what Google does is, it basically goes to, let's say, Google Compute and says, "Give me five machines." It gets those five machines. What I, what I was asking though is, how does the developer who's, who's writing the app 
know oh. what five servers to hit? Is he, is he supposed to hit the Cooper API to do that? Or does he just come in after it's been so these you, find that out? you can define names here, right? Okay, so, yeah, so they should go in here and not use these. So, uh, or should yeah. I use no, I mean, once the provisioning is done, the machines are consistent. They are there. We don't. So I can log into this machine now. So you would just communicate to the developer this is, these are your hosts. Yeah, so in fact, in the Cooper, you, we basically send an email out. These are the five nodes that we have provisioned for you. Yeah. Log in and do whatever. So um, those wouldn't change, so you would add a constraint so those wouldn't change. Oh, the, yeah, 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 okay. They will not change. So we just showed how you can kind of, you can. Yeah, you can do it, but what it does is it makes sure that, so for example, uh, a main critical service, like a main <coughs> node, is on machine name. <coughs> it's not going to reprovision another machine and move the main node there. It's going to, once it gets materialized, that like this particular service on this machine name, when it is reconfiguring it, takes the new constraints, new thing that you have provided, right? Add these two services to it. Plus also, once the, once the things that are being materialized, it uses that as the constraint again, and feeds those two again, and comes up with the solution. In which case, the constraint would be, don't move this particular service from this machine. Right? So the service doesn't get moved. So it'll always stay. Once it's materialized, it'll always stay. So it simplifies that process. And uh, yeah, you can, uh, again, for fun, you can just go back and start, stop, remove, you can do whatever. So for example, if I, here's an interesting thing. What do you guys think if I start a Zookeeper server, what should all get started? Every, pretty much everything should get started, right? Because it's dependent on everything. Um, it does. So if I just say, restart this guy, everything goes in the process of restarting now. So I don't know, if I start Zookeeper, what else should be started? That's again the knowledge that's built into the DAG when the administrator provided the constraints of how these services are stitched together. So it is being restarted now. So if you see it is starting, it's stopping first the monitoring because otherwise alerts will go off. So it stops that first. Again, you define the order and how the service DAG works. So it stops the monitoring. We use sensor for it. Stop the monitoring, then it goes and starts stopping like. It's basically, what is it doing? Yeah, starting the yarn node manager. It's pretty much starting the whole cluster. So nothing has changed. Why would it take the, the restart? I, I forced the restart. Or let's say if uh, only the configuration at the hive and edge will not save. Yeah, only those, those, will, those will start. Here, I basically forced this start. Okay. I forced it. So if it's a configuration, then it checks only the configuration the, the, the configuration that you have changed. Let's say it affects only, let's say, HBase one, uh, HBase region server. Then only region servers. So my processing currently happening by talking to the job tracker and name node will not fail at that point. The, those will continue. Those will. But if like the problem that we had seen is from a, like. Every time, what used to happen is we used to go and make a zookeeper change, and then we used to forget all the processes to be started in order. So you basically go and start something, it's like, okay, it's done, take it. The developer is looking, oh, this thing is not working, okay, it seems like you didn't start in order. So then you get it back, then again, start the process. So we used to spend a lot of time. So we built took all of that knowledge, and the stuff that we used to do at Yap, managing 8,000 nodes, 20 data centers, just for two. Um, just from my team, which used to be like four people managing that. So we took all that and put it into Cooper essentially. So who who manages these templates and, and how do you manage the, the forking of them? Uh, with Chef Cookbooks, you've got the community cookbooks and people always like bring them internally and fork them. Like how do you how do you get upstream back into it? So like say you've got so brilliant is knowledge on how to do this this template of uh, all these services together. And I've got one thing that just doesn't jive with it. Like, how do I how do I work with the community to you know, get that in, or uh, you know? So we have uh, Cooper templates. Sure. So that's normal community procedure. Okay. So so it might not be just like people don't people generally don't like Chef is like the most popular one, but people use other things. People like some companies do just shell scripts. And when we ask them, can you please commit it? They are ashamed because it's outside community. 
because they have more traditional way of doing it, right? And they have their own uh, enterprise inbuilt, like instead of RPMD or something else to install. Sure, but I imagine we're going to get let's say say we start using this today, we're going to get some lift out of the the, the 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 you get the real lift out of the knowledge, like the like we were saying the templates, like that this is connected to this or whatever. Like um, I guess I'm not seeing how are those. Are those managed open source also, the, the templates? Yeah, you know, the templates are. As separate entities? Uh, we're, we're, okay. Okay. Uh, see that Google templates? Slash Google templates, I guess. Are they in Git or? They are in Git. Fair enough. Yeah, there is a Cooper internal. templates are essentially where you can just go. I mean, we just started actually, it's been two months where we started open source, or like Cooper templates actually. Otherwise, <coughs> most of the stuff was in Cooper internals um, because we were hashing out all of the issues and getting good examples out of it, but now it's it's ready for people to use. Um, yeah, and these templates are like, we maintain them as like, just JSON objects. Do you did you use any intelligence from like external package manager? Like you could use OR and find out things that naturally conflict via yeah, like the, the the OR the Pacman repo that actually has like these two things will conflict with each other. These versions of libraries. So like it's that. very different for different things. I mean, uh, some people use. So it's like for example, if you're within like if you guys run within your company, right? You might be using a different package manager. Yeah, I mean, those are it's universal kind of constants. That's why I mentioned it before. Like, I, if I'm still going to install like Debian and I've got these two version specific things, different package managers have the same thing. They just do it different ways. And I didn't know if you guys use any of that intelligence at all. No, we haven't. We haven't. Um, we haven't gone to like we haven't heard a use case for that. So, I mean, if there is something specific, then we should discuss on the open. But yeah, so the, the, there are uh, so Cooper Dash user, Cooper Dash Dab have Google groups. You can come and discuss with the people using. You can see um, things that they're trying out. Uh, so we just had a new release actually, 9.9, .9, and it has um, quite a number of features actually. So if you look at the release notes, a uh, lot went into the 9.9 .9 actually. A bunch of improvements. Uh, we added security, so all the communication goes on TLS. Um, we added the secure communications between because sometimes you pass passwords through, so you, you don't want to have the communication. So all the security was added. A um, lot of complex cluster configurations, being able to maintain them. I think we also had the initial stages of. So yeah, so this has been a very good release for us. I mean, there is the next release that is going to be coming there. It's a very well documented project. It's not like any other open source project. We treat it like a product. We use it internally because everyone who comes to, um, who joins our company on day one, he has to get everything up and running on Google. And he gets to this, uh, he has to make a change to the code check it in, test it on the cluster, and he has to commit it within 24 hours. So the code review takes another two days, but that's that's the normal process that it goes to. So we have made it, um, so there are other companies that are also using um, Cooper. So we have just started going out and talking about this um, after we have used it for quite a long time now. Uh, um, and we have added all these features that we felt that were painful to us for it to be much more effective. Cool. What on-premises providers do you guys support right now? Uh, OpenStack. And there are versions of OpenStack actually. I don't even remember the yeah. names. They are like very funny names. You know, Ice House and, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Kilo. <laughs> yeah, they have like very funny names. I always. So yeah, so we do that, but like you can also write a simple HTTP provider. And the interesting part of Cooper is you don't need to install Cooper. If you install, I don't know whether it is true or not, I can check back and let you guys know, but you can download a single node. 
of Google. It comes in a standalone, runs on a laptop. The one of the template on that standalone is to provision a real Google cluster. And then you provision it, and then you transport all of the configurations. You can experiment, you create a Google cluster, and then that becomes your cluster, and then you start managing it. So it simplifies the whole process from that perspective. So we have also people who are running it in a HA mode. They want high availability. So we have nothing built exactly per se for that, but uh, this is something from an installation line, I think. Or upgrade or start configuration. I don't remember where it is, but um, So there's like different configurations you can run it in. So you can see you can have <coughs> across this proxy servers. So when you want HA, it's, it's a little bit of work. So we're trying to simplify that. What data store does it naturally? Uh, it's a pluggable. It uses MySQL right now, but it's, you give any JDBC driver to it. Uh, most of the coordination is happening through Zookeeper. That's another dependency you have. But you can also do multi data center. So hot, hot, and uh, custom replication or synchronous DB So you can, you can set it up for multi data centers. Nice. And it'll manage multiple open stack instances, which can be in multiple data centers. Right, so you can essentially have a provider that has open stack instance A, B, C. One other thing, last thing, you can set callbacks. Uh, this goes into, yeah, this is the thing that I was talking about. So you can set callbacks on that. So you can essentially define what happens if. So let's say you want to send emails at every stage of provision. Got created. You, you want the person to know what I, what the system is doing. Provision machines. I'm now installing this software. I'm installing this software. Oh, it failed. You can keep sending emails. For uh, or you can choose to send whenever you want. So uh, that's an easy thing to configure. Uh, I think let's say uh, Java. Java, you guys will be a little bit. You can create a workflow in Jira and have it move it. What? Create a workflow in Jira and have it move. Move, it. yeah, so you can do that in theory. Um, so let's see. So you can easily set this up. It's just a simple configuration where you can say, on start you give a URL or triggers you give. You can define what triggers you want it to be, and give an HTTP endpoint, and you can define what that HTTP endpoint is. And that could be that will the best interesting part of that. It is it'll get you will get the whole cluster information at that point in time. So you can pick and choose and construct a nice message out of it, and then forward it to email it or pop it up in the UI, or like whatever you want to do. Chitra. So you can essentially use this to integrate the whole provisioning system. Cool. Yes. Is, <laughs> is this mainly for just provisioning the, the nodes, or is it also for? We are going to be adding monitoring. Deploying applications. Deploying applications. Like testing code on, on the war on top. Yeah. So I, haven't, I haven't shown you guys this, but so we have something called we haven't open sourced it yet, but we have something called a beamer. So this deploys built a beamer is built on top of let me see what it is. So, so you can create a cluster, you can run a test on a cluster, you can take a snapshot of the cluster, you can deploy any software on the cluster. So your applications can be deployed easily. So the application can be a template or a 
definition inside the tool. So does Beamer use Docker or how does Beamer versus So Docker? Beamer is a client to uh, Cooper. It's just, it has a lot of smart. So, um, so the way our people use Beamer is, So you can see, people then exposes templates, reset, unregister, list, create, register, show install software, delete. Like it, you, you can do all of these different kinds of things with the Beamer. It's again integrated. It's client of of the Cooper. We're pretty much will open source it pretty soon, but right now we are still hashing out. You can even see how crappy the, the command line is, right? Um, so we're just clearing this up. So we have been running this for quite some time now, but the way we use it. Developer on the command line says, create me a cluster. He can then look at all of the cluster. Then he says, install the software in the cluster. Then he says, Beamer, take the snapshot of the cluster. Then he says, Beamer, test the cluster. So he doesn't he doesn't go anywhere else. He's able to do end-to-end -end just sitting from there. And not only you can do Hadoop clusters, you can do MongoDB, you can any application stack, anything you want. So he doesn't move. Like that's why we get to a point where people are like amazingly going through. Like our product, we are able to release uh, every four weeks because every developer goes through this process of being able to do that extremely fast. And our DevOps is behind the scene managing all of that. And they never talk to any. They do talk to each other, but like it's they don't need to talk about hey, can you give me this cluster or can you install this software? They don't need. So they're completely independent. Earlier on the UI, you showed that we could set a run list, um, and then uh, which moved right on from that. Oh. Um, so does that pull the the cookbooks directly from like supermarket uh, out of the open source? No, it doesn't. So you have to build up that repository. You have to build up the repository. Okay. Uh, because you don't want that to be happening, right? Sure. You well, want to cache your versions. Uh, if you want, you can. But yeah. Generally, that's not the best practice. I have heard. I'm not a chef expert. The only time I got involved with chef was when the data bag was causing the problem. So that's the, that's that's my knowledge. So you start to build up that repository that that it knows about. Okay. How do you do that? Huh? How do you add this to the repo? So about? either you add it to the sh you add it to your chef server, right? I mean, you you basically have a central server, or you basically maintain a recipes. This is like a definition. I don't know. I, I'm oh, not. so you just attach a chef server. So as long as your like CI is, is uploading off of Burks or whatever, then you yeah. got your whole chef server with all of your yeah. your cookbooks you can pull. That's from. all I know. I, I don't know. Any questions? Is it too much information? This is awesome. You meant to share Docker. Yeah, we have Docker. What is it actually builds the Docker? No, it doesn't build the Docker. I mean, it pulls from the Docker. So you, you have to create the Docker. Uh, yeah. Image. And you put it on the Docker, and then it's just like. And then it deploys Yeah, yeah. Because the thing is, like, Docker does provide, like, one container at a time, right? But, like, you need coordination on this machine, which will be, like, and then you have to rewire the network. Since you guys know, a lot of people. So that all have, has been hashed out in Google and in the It's very painful. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we have solved it hundred percent, but it's always an ongoing process. That, but it works for most of the cases. But it's a very painful process to rewire the network inside board, outside boards. You have to NAT it. It's, it's pretty complex. Depends on how smart your routers are. What? Depends on how smart your routers are. No, for like on the single box, like Docker exposes, you need the NAT between just between the processes because it firewalls with like, um, I think it uses CH group and the Linux control. So. Yeah, but I, I don't know if you guys use Docker Composer at all. I'm trying to improve that. Oh, is it? Yeah, I mean, it, they're, they're not done. I, I'm using it after this week. Yes. Anytime you search on Docker stuff, you basically get like network problems all the time. So. <laughs> that is pretty, pretty good. But it's a sweet system, so it's like close to Download it, give it a try, and you can use the open source um, mailing list for 
guys have any questions. Cool. Let's give Nitin a hand. Your battery you. made it. Huh? Your battery yeah, made two, it. Yeah, 2%. <laughs> <laughs> There's cards here on this table with the instructions for how to download it, so help yourself.